Welcome to the Voices for Voices podcast, sponsored by Redwood Living. Thank you for joining us today. I am Justin Allen Hayes, founder and executive director of Voices for Voices, host and humanitarian. You can learn more about Voices for Voices on our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube channel at Voices for Voices and our website, voicesforvoices.org. Voices for Voices is a 501c3 nonprofit charity organization that survives solely on donations. So if you are able to, please consider heading over to voicesforvoices.org to help us continue our mission and the goal and dream of mine to help 3 billion people over the course of my lifetime and beyond. Or you can also send a donation to the mailing address of Voices for Voices at 2388 Beckett Circle, Stowe, Ohio, 44224. We're also available on the Cash App at Voices for Voices. Are you or somebody you know looking for a volunteer opportunity? If so, please reach out to us today via email at president at voicesforvoices.org. Now, I founded Voices for Voices to provide a platform for folks to share their stories with others as we work to break the stigma around mental health, accessibility, and disabilities, helping get people the help they need while also helping them prepare or transition into the workforce with the Voices for Voices Career Center, where we connect talent with opportunity for both job seekers and employers alike from coast to coast and in every industry and job level. And who can forget about merchandise? The Voices for Voices merchandise shop is up and running at voicesforvoices.org forward slash shop where shipping is always free. And again, all donations are 100% tax deductible. Please welcome and join me today in welcoming our guest. She has been inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, has earned the Dole Leadership Prize, appeared on screen in A Mother's Courage, talking back to autism, a documentary narrated by actress Kate Winslet, and the inspiration behind the 2010 biography drama titled Temple Grandin, to which actress Claire Danes won a Screen Actors Guild Award and Golden Globe Award playing Dr. Temple Grandin. Dr. Grandin has also written many award-winning books, including Navigating Autism, Visual Thinking, in her latest release, Autism and Education, The Way I See It, where Dr. Grandin discusses the real issues that parents, teachers, and kids face every day. And Dr. Grandin has also been honored with a sculpture housed within the JBS Global Food Innovation Center on the campus of Colorado State University, where she joins us from today. She's also listed as one of the top 10 college professors in the United States, and is acknowledged as the preeminent authority on animal behavior. It is an honor and pleasure to introduce our guest, Dr. Temple Grandin. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. It's Grandin. It's so great to be here today. Absolutely, uh, and, and for our viewers and listeners, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, Another individual, that's uh, Heidi LaRue. Uh, she is on the Voices for Voices board. She is a supervising counselor, art therapist, and chemical dependency counselor. So she'll be jumping in uh, from time to time at asking questions. Uh, so Dr. Grant, I just want to uh, start out by uh, getting your feedback on, uh, it, I understand that art for you came, the interest came at an early age. Uh, how did that manifest itself? And then throughout your career, how did you see maybe the changes and the ebbs and flows to that? Well, when I was a little kid, probably third grade or so, came obvious I was good at art, but I would tend to just draw the same horse head over and over again. So my mother always encouraged me to go draw the whole horse, draw the stable, draw the saddle. What you want to do with something a kid gets fixated on is broaden it 
and expand. Okay, let's say it was cars. Well, read about them, do math with them, take that interest and expand them. I was just talking to a mother the other day and her kid loves excavating machines. Ah. Well, you can learn about how those work. You know, how do hydraulic systems work? I mean, there's a lot of things that you could do to e expand that interest. And then in my career, I've designed uh, livestock handling facilities. That certainly used my art uh, interest. Uh, now, everything that I was doing beforehand was, uh, you know, just done freehand. Oh, okay. And there was one assignment that I had in college that was really good. And we had to spend an hour and a half art class drawing a picture of our own shoe. Each student had, had to take one of their shoes off, mm -hmm. put it out just in front of them while they're sitting in a chair in about the three quarters position, you know, like this, and, and draw it very slowly with pencil without erasing to make you see the shoe. And that was a really useful um, excitement. I had a really ratty old sneaker that I drew, and I wish I still had that drawing. And then when I got involved with the design of cattle handling facilities, I had no idea how to do drafting. And, and I worked for a while at a feedlot construction company, and there was a draftsman there named Davy Jones, and he was an absolutely wonderful draftsman. And I saw, well, how does he do it? Also, I found that using the ruler forced my mind to really slow down okay so that i can see the thing that i'm drawing and i draw mostly steel and concrete construction and i saw how davy would make a pipe look round how he would draw concrete part the dirt part and and then i used the same instruments that he used wow. um but uh you have to develop talent yeah i can't emphasize that enough the other thing i had to learn how to do is how to relate a flat blueprint to a building. Like for example, on a drawing of a building, there might be little squares in the building. Mm -hmm. And those little squares are columns. Uh -huh. And the way I learned how to um, understand the squares was to take the drawing for the Swift meatpacking plant, this would be back in early 70s, walk around the plant with the floor plans. Okay. And they included even the parking lot stripes in this floor plan to where I could relate everything on that drawing to the actual equipment and structure in the plant. I had to learn how to take that flat drawing and relate it back to things that I could see. I'm a visual thinker, yeah. but I had to learn how to take a square on a drawing and make it become a concrete column in my mind. Wow. That, that's fascinating. The, it came to you at, at such a, an early age. I know myself, I was uh, 35 when I kind of went through my, my mental health crisis, five-day inpatient stay, and part of the program was, was art therapy. And up until that time, I didn't, I didn't believe I was a, a, a good artist. And so that was in my mind of, well, if I'm not good at something, I can't do it. But what I found through, uh, through the program was it didn't matter how good I was at, as an artist. That, like you mentioned, the process the detail that goes into it, how important that was. And I, I think that once I realized that, uh, I found myself uh, being more interested in, in art for, for myself, not, not just uh, for, for other purposes. Um, and, and that's how I actually I met Heidi, is uh, through my, uh, one of my group therapies coming, coming out, out, out of the, the hospital. Um, how has been, uh, I'm gonna say like I know you have an expanded career, but how's been the the feedback on it, the the art side when you would share others when you, you mentioned well, that? Well, I had to learn to. I mean, I was doing the drawings professionally, okay. so the way I sold jobs was to simply show off my drawings. Okay. Here's one of my drawings right here in one of my books. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. Yep. There's one of my drawings, uh, and what I learned to do was to show off my work. I hope that's clear. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. I designed the front end of every Cargill beef plant in North America back in the late 80s to early 90s. And the way I sold those jobs was showing off the work. Okay. I had to do work that other people wanted. So I'd show off the drawings, and I'd show off the pictures of other completed projects. Okay. I learned to sell my work okay. rather than myself. And the thing that I see with a lot of parents, mm -hmm. parents are saying, oh, my kid's really a good artist. 
but then they don't think to put some of that artwork on their phone. Uh, yeah. Maybe they could show, sell some commissions for their kid. Yeah. That doesn't even cross their mind because there's some autistic artists um, uh, like Grant Marnier, the eco artist, makes beautiful uh, artwork, horses and other animals with ripped paper. I mean, he's sold some, you know, $5,000, $10,000 pieces of art on commission. Wow. Great. Heidi, do you want to uh, do you want to jump in with, with? Yeah, there was the first thing I was thinking about was your shoe. I have so many ideas that I'm thinking about right now. I was thinking about the shoe drawing and how that I don't know whether they would have called it contour line drawing at the time where you're looking at the item and you don't really look at the paper very much. And you're well, that's thinking... kind of what we did, and we, we, we had to take the entire class period to draw it. They recommended just drawing really, really light, um, you know, and drew the shoe in three dimensions. They had us put it at the three-quarter position so that it, it wasn't completely sideways, it wasn't straight on, and, and to try to, like, almost trace the shoe onto the paper. Okay. And one of the things they did was to make you really slow down. Yeah. And that's another thing when I started doing drafting, the slowing down and using the ruler. Then I could see exactly how a fence might be set in a concrete curb and then draw that. Yeah, I'm thinking about it in terms of like mindful awareness, like really being present and thinking not like I'm drawing a shoe, but like I'm drawing where this line connects to this one and how these two compare with each other, that sort of thing. Well, here's and another then, one of my drawings right here. Okay. Yeah, they're just so beautiful. Yeah. I'm just really well, drawn into them. Of detail, and I drew what I would draw a drawing so that the people working in the field could see exactly how to build it. Right. And that ties in so much with what you've been talking about about career. I mean, in the book, visual thinking, and in some of your presentations, um, taking people's interests and helping them use it in a way that's very productive. That's right, that's right. You know, and ending up in a career. I um, just the other recently heard about a lady with autism that um, went into cake decorating. Uh -huh. And an interview for her was showing off pictures of the cakes and the bakery instantly hired her. And that's a real recent example. The other thing that's good about doing things with something like drawing is there's no multitasking. She'd right. be working on one cake at a time and then you'd go on to the next cake. But that's an example of something where you're selling the work. So for our uh, listeners and viewers, uh, autism, uh, I, I myself, I'm on, on the lower end of the spectrum, the, the sounds, the lights, when you mentioned on the, on the phone earlier today about you know, work, working the McDonald's drive through and having to do all these different things, like all, all that is just so complex to, to myself, at what point in, in your life were uh, you made aware of autism in yourself? Well, I, I had speech delay okay. until I was four. So it was obvious I had a problem, but there's a lot of other people where there's no speech delay. Oftentimes it shows up when the kid's seven or eight years old and they have no friends. There's also adults that get um, diagnosed later on in life. And that diagnosis can often give them a lot of insight because it will explain why they've been socially awkward. You know, and it's almost a relief to find out. But on the other hand, I'm seeing um, situations where a teenager has got an autism label or maybe some other label, and they're getting so pampered and overprotected, they're not learning skills like shopping. Yes. You know, and everything's getting done for them. You know, and these are things that I learned in elementary school. Yeah. And, and I think that's an issue, not learning not learning basic skills. Right. You said, um, you've said your concerns about the trades that, um... Uh, this is what I've talked about in my book, Visual Thinking. We have a huge shortage, high-end skilled trades. Let me just give you some examples. Please. The U.S. no longer makes the state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine, food processing equipment, poultry processing plant, for example, all the equipment is coming in from Holland. Hmm. And it goes back to our educational system. You see in Holland and other countries like Germany and Denmark and Italy, kids choose in ninth grade to go Votech route or university route. And there's a lot of good jobs in high-end skilled trades. I can tell you, 
that artificial intelligence will not replace. I can see some web design, low level programming, stuff like that, just going right out um, with AI, but that's not gonna make the heating and air conditioning work or the water system work or the electrical system work. And there's a tendency to look at those in, in Europe, they don't look down on that. Where here, just the other day, I was on a Zoom call like less than a week ago with a local high school animal science class. And I had a girl come up, you know, they'd come up to the mic to answer the question and say, my guidance counselor told me not to take any Votech stuff. Oh. Well, I think that's really bad because I can see in the future, those are the jobs that are not going to go away. Yeah. yeah. Right. I'm watching AI really, really carefully. I can see a lot of low-level coding stuff on getting taken over by AI. Something that really stood out to me was the part about the um, some of the things you've been saying recently about there being so much emphasis on verbal skills, and then also what you had to say about algebra. <laughs> I totally well, get that. Algebra, like, you see, a lot of the people I worked with, people that owned large metalworking shops, they couldn't do algebra either because right. it's too abstract. Right. And I'm, you have to be able to do arithmetic. But I'm seeing students that want to become a veterinary nurse or even a regular nurse for people uh, on their second and third algebra class. And that's going to keep them from becoming a nurse or a veterinary nurse. Yeah. Uh, yes, arithmetic, drug dosing, drug dosing they got to do in their sleep. That's non-negotiable. Right. But that, that um, math can be memorized. And there's other things you need algebra for. Quantum computing, you'll need it for that. You'll need it for orbital mechanics. I mean, a whole bunch of engineering stuff. But there's a whole lot of other stuff where you don't need it. Right. And the thing that's going to be ironic, watching the AI uh, stuff uh, coming in, is uh, hands-on skilled trades not going to get replaced by AI. No. Right. Yep. When... And neither will, and neither will things like, okay, you're a counselor. Yeah, we're right. People are always going to want the human connection. Look what happened to Peloton. They had all this fancy exercise equipment for use at home. They about went broke. <laughs> people want to go back and exercise with other people. With a person, yeah. Right. Yeah, with right. other people. They have their exercise buddies they see every, every right. um, time. Yeah. You have multiple works and multiple media platforms. When, when did you feel like sharing your experience was really taken hold where you wanted to share that you know through through books and and let people know about it because so, some people are are introverted and they don't want to they don't feel comfortable sharing but you're sharing well, I, and it's I, awesome i first got asked to share it there's a when i was in arizona i was there's an occupational therapist named lorna jean king and she had me you know start out with some very very small meetings but in terms of uh you know for the all through the 80s and the 90s i never told customers about it okay i just um i let my work sell itself i made myself very good at my work just like the lady with the cake deck and decorator yeah. she's on the spectrum but her work decorating cakes is really good and and it's making yourself good at a skill that other people want and appreciate now I could see AI laying out cattle handling facilities, mm. but the thing that uh, it's not going to do is when you got some real mess in a plant with equipment, it's not going to fix that. No, it's not. It's not going to fix that. I, and I had a chance to go visit um, a big um, uh, biomedical laboratory, what they call a biosecurity level four lab. You know, you got the people in the spacesuits. Yeah. You know what I learned about that building? What's you that? floors on that building. Okay. The second floor is the labs. The other three floors are support equipment. Uh, three floors of support equipment. One floor of labs. And it's all high-end skilled trade stuff. A bunch of it. HVAC on steroids. A bunch of other stuff. Without high-end skilled trades, that lab would not operate. Period. Uh, they wouldn't be able to run it. He no. said something operate you said something example, a minute ago. I just was there just a week ago. Wow. Yeah, that's recent. I mean. Yeah, that's real recent. That's now. <laughs> that's now. It's not, yeah. And the thing about the girl asked me the question about the guidance counselor said she shouldn't take a Votech class. That was less than a week ago. 
Oh wow, that's that's terrible. That's a shame. But... Yeah, because these are the jobs I'm looking really, really carefully. At. It reminds me of that old Westworld movie uh, where they all they have all the robots there, and there's one maintenance man fixing the fountain. And he said, <laughs> "I have to have a few people like me because the robots don't and water don't mix very well." No, they don't. <laughs> Yeah. Heidi, I, I need to jump in. Yeah, I just I'm excited because I have like a million questions. But I was thinking about um, this is a statement too, but the idea that some people would think that people with autism lack empathy, and how that seems really absurd to me, depending on the person. Well, and, I have a lot of empathy for physical hardship. Like I've looked at awful pictures after a storm or after a war or something like that. Yeah. And people standing in the ruins of their house, standing in a broken apartment building in a broken apartment. I right. I have, yeah. have a lot of empathy for physical hardship. Well, that and really, then... really be, it really sucked to go back and your house is just a pile of splinters. Yeah, but even in some of your writings, when you talk about like getting inside of, um, I don't remember what it was called, but you got inside of a space to look at what the perspective would be. <laughs> well, that was looking at what cattle were seeing. Yeah. So the very first work I ever did, I got down into cattle shoots to see what cattle were seeing. And yeah. there are stuff like shadows, uh, things we tend to not pay attention to, shadows and, and reflections and, and the sun shining in their eyes, stuff we don't tend to notice. Well, I, I didn't realize at the time that other, many other people think verbally. But I think visually, in my book on visual thinking, yeah. mm -hmm. I discuss the three kinds of thinking. I'm an object visualizer, so we're good at animals, photography, skilled trades, and uh, <laughs> and art. Yeah. And then you have your mathematical mind, music and math, and, and then you have verbal thinkers, and then you have mixtures of the different kinds of thinkers. And so for a visual thinker, it was obvious to look at what cattle were looking at. And right. I get, find out until I was in my late 30s that I'll have other, a lot of other people thought in words. I feel like, I don't know if this was what it was like for you, but I could imagine being inside that shoot, thinking, I'm going to get in there and see what it looks like to them, and then thinking, oh my gosh, no wonder. Like, no wonder this is upsetting to them. That, to me, whether I'm not, I might not be saying it exactly the way that would have felt to you, but that, to me, feels like empathy. Well, yeah, and I'm imagining, you know, the cattle don't know what it is. I get asked all the time, cattle know they're going to get slaughtered. Well, they're more afraid of a shadow that looked like a spider. Right. That appeared for about an hour every afternoon when the sun was out. And they wouldn't walk over the spider monster shadow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is, this is fascinating. What, so we talked a, a little bit about you know, the, the algebra, uh, you know, screening out the potentially. The problem is the algebra is too abstract. Yes. I need to convert things to a picture. The other problem I have, and this caused some people to lose some good skilled trade jobs like electrician apprentice and building fencing, is the boss would yeah, boom, 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 do this ceiling lamp, blah, 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 light switch, blah, 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 blah you know, junction yeah. box, you know, something else. And I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. And what needs to be done in that situation is let the person just make a pilot's checklist of the things they're supposed to install, or if it's um, close out the Walmart cash register in the, at the end of the shift, uh, just a bullet of what are the closing out of the cash register steps. Just they, they need an external working memory. Mm -hmm. And I would need that to you know do these jobs. And even on my design jobs, we'd have a meeting and I'd, I'd very clearly, what is the outcome of this project? I'd know exactly which land I could put it on, you know, what the railroad right of way is, uh, what the chain speed of the plant was, you know, all the things, all the parameters, uh, the uh, great big uh, water pump. Yep, I had to design around that. You could not take that out. No. You see, and I would have all of this stuff uh, written down beforehand. So you would have something like a list with bullet points, something yep, like that. Exactly what I did. And you could even say you had like something like an index card with bullet points and then just, you know, put a plastic sheet over it or something. That is so well, much better. Let's than... say another kind of thing, because I have to have an external working memory, 
Here's a job a little more hard that I'd have a lot of trouble with. Let's say I get a job at the airport as a gate agent. Oh, yeah. You know, okay. Now, that's not as complicated as a ticket agent. There's like 12 things you got to do on that computer. You know, print boarding passes, plane seats, print boarding passes, <laughs> uh, gate check bags. Now, if somebody just goes boom, 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 quick like that, showing me, I can't remember that sequence. I can't either. Cannot remember that sequence. So if I had to do that job, let's say today, I'd have to go somewhere that's not busy. Okay, let me now show me the, the, the key sequence for gate checking a bag. And I'd write them down, printing a boarding pass, and I'd write them down. Then I would go home and practice. Mm -hmm. yeah. I might even make a jingle up. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the kind of stuff I'd be good at were frozen jet bridges. I want to make that problem go away. I have sat on a plane for an hour, oh. frozen jet bridge. You see, that's the kind of stuff I understand. How can we prevent that from happening? I'd find out exactly what was freezing on them yeah. and try to figure out a way to prevent that. You see, that's something I'd be good at, getting rid of frozen jet bridges that don't move. Uh, it's meaningful. And the person that's did where you can just show once how to do the keystrokes, that person wouldn't know what to do with a frozen jet bridge. This right. is where we need all the different kinds of minds. Right. Need them all. Because the thing with the frozen jet bridge, we got to prevent it from getting frozen. That's right. That's the thing. But you, then you got to find out what's happening. Is the wheel just spinning on the ground? Or is like thing telescopes? Is it, what's getting ice in there where it won't telescope? You see, I see it. Yeah. And that's my new example, so I'm not giving you yucky meat plant examples. <laughs> no, I mean, you're starting with the end in mind, and that makes, it, to me, being on the spectrum and, and, and Heidi, uh, to be able to, it, to see an end, not just a part of the process. And I think some jobs, that's all you do. You just do a well, piece of the see, process. Uh, there were three good skilled trades jobs lost because they, this is recent. These are recent. This is, this is uh, where they didn't write down a checklist. Okay, what they're supposed to do. These were electrical things. Okay. What things they were supposed to install, order they were installing. And if they just spent two minutes jotting them down, they wouldn't have lost the job. And how can this and this uh, problems with working memory? This comes up all the time. And then rapid multitasking jobs like a McDonald's takeout window want to avoid those. Yeah, Heidi, I, I think that's you had something. Just so uh, the heat, the sound, the overwhelming social aspect of it, the light, and then, like you're saying, the working memory. Working yeah. memory now with the light, one of the biggest problems in an indoor environment where there's no windows or limited windows is flicker on LEDs and fluorescent lights. The <laughs> yeah. number one problem. And right. the way you can diagnose that is to um, take your high end, fancy new phone, <laughs> film the room in slow motion. Now I'd wave yeah. because then I'm going to play it back. I got to make sure it's moving slow. Um, yeah. It's moving slow motion. And you can find those lights that flicker. And it not only bothers autistic people, but it also bothers people with head injuries, oh. like veterans, for example, sometimes are bothered by that. And so what do I do if I'm stuck in an office where uh, uh, the lights are terrible? You need to get a lamp from home, mm -hmm. find a really bright LED or some other thing that doesn't flicker and put it next to your desk. Oh. That's the thing yeah. you would need to do or get over by a window. And I always like to try to figure out simple accommodations mm -hmm. and, and, light and things that people can do and not lose jobs right. because right. you write down the things you were supposed to do. And then, and the way I would explain it to the boss is if pilots need a checklist, I need one too. Mm -hmm. That's right. FFA requires it for every single flight. And you want that as a, as a passenger, right? You mean, well, of you, you don't want somebody to be like, no, I'm going to wing it. No. Uh, and they're just trying to do pilot checklists in medicine now for surgery. Make sure they don't leave anything inside a person. Right. So something that motivates you and helps you um, use your gifts is knowing that it's um, meaningful. The work is meaningful, but oh, yeah, you're doing something that you see, like you take a nonverbal person with autism and they make them put pegs in a board and then take them out and put them back in again. They know that's fake work. No, they need to be doing something that's real work. 
and not snake busy ward. Right. The examples that you've given, some of them have been safety related. That stands out to me when you mentioned the bridge and um, some of the things with the cattle. Sounds like things that have to do well, with. I have a whole chapter in visual thinking on disasters. Okay, okay. mathematicians, you need the visual thinkers like me to tell uh -huh. you we should have put watertight doors on the Fukushima nuclear power plant to protect the electrically driven emergency cooling pump that's not going to run underwater. Right. I can't design a nuclear reactor, but all I know is that that pump doesn't run when I need it. The results are horrible. Something else that stands out to me about your process is the idea of trying to back things up and in, in sequence and then prevent it. Well, yeah, and and you see seeing stuff. Okay, that bridge that fell down, I put in the afterward. Uh, they probably hadn't painted it. And that was a pretty flimsy bridge where um, you can't have too much rust eating into it. And if they'd painted it, it probably wouldn't have fallen down. You know, okay. you, know you can't lose half the steel wall thickness on that type of bridge. See, I just see it. Yeah. I mean, I even yeah. think of what, it's, when I was growing up, I would see my mom making a list to go, go to get groceries at the grocery store. But then I would see her making lists to, like you said, just maybe smaller tasks. Uh, and I, you know, being naive growing up, I was like, oh, that's just what old people do. Like, when I get older, that's just what they, they do. But now seeing myself, it really uh, bridges that, and here's the bridge, uh, to, to your thinking in, in your work, uh, to be able to just have a, a checklist, to make sure you're doing what you set out to do. So if you want to do thing A, you need to know the three steps, like you said, to do thing A. You don't need to know what to do, to do thing B or C. And when it's written down, it, it helps, and it helps free the, free the mind a, a little bit. And well, I worked with a lot of people that I know were autistic in, in the high end, the metalworking uh, skilled trades, and owned shops, had multiple patents, were selling stuff around the world. They were most had barely graduated from high school, taken a welding class. And if they hadn't taken a well, hadn't taken that welding class, they wouldn't have been making the stuff. Right. And then on the mathematical side, also I've seen a lot of uh, people on the autism spectrum, computer programmers, people in wow. physics. And so, you know, the thing about autism, it's a true continuous trait. Yeah. Going from Einstein who had no speech till age three to somebody who's nonverbal that cannot dress themselves. I think it was a big mistake when they took the Asperger's out, which is basically socially awkward with no speech delay, merged it in with autism where there is speech delay. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, could you clarify? I, well, I just missed part way, of you your sentence. Remember, the diagnostic protocols are not, you know, verify the lab test, like, okay, we do a test on you until you get tuberculosis. Right. You know, that's a very, very definitive test. Um, it's based on a behavioral profile. You see, and for years it used to be to be autistic, you had to have speech delay. Okay. Then so, the Asperger's, which is autistic traits, but no speech delay. Okay. So, so I know the that Asperger there's... type are not going to get diagnosed when they're three. Right. I, they knew something was drastically wrong with me when I was two and a half. Right. right. So it would help if we had clarity on that and there are words that are upsetting to people like high functioning and low functioning. Well, that, I, I, I've taken that out of myself. I, my old publications say that, you know, I've oh. been for almost uh, over 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't use that term anymore. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. All my new, I, newer stuff, that's been removed. Old stuff. Yeah, is yeah, I'm I not. Um, I understand where people are coming from. So I'm just uh, speaking gently. I'd rather you know? just say fully verbal or non-verbal. Non yeah, so, say what it is. Non-verbals, there's some good books written by people who type independently that are non-verbal. Right. And then I know that there's a lot of debate around the term Asperger's because of um, the the man named Dr. Asperger. Yeah, he, he did some bad things. Okay. They, 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 another thing to call it is simply autism with no speech delay. Right. Okay. That's basically so, what it is. So again, what you're talking about is not adding layers of judgment or using words in a way that like just 
adds so much, but it's just very functional. Like well, I just found that for me, the way I sold jobs, I worked freelance on this for many, many years, was simply showing off the drawings, showing off the, uh, the, the pictures of jobs. And then I was writing in the trade press. I mean, every, every field has its trade press, even car washes. They had some magazine <laughs> called Auto Laundry News. <laughs> and you, I wrote in the trade press about how to handle cattle and how to design facilities in magazines like Beef. <laughs> so there's just a, I mean, I like what you're saying. I like this theme that I hear over and over again that is about being effective, like thinking about what works. Well, that's right. And the other thing is I've written extensively about problems with anxiety. Yeah. Uh, I have terrible, terrible problems with anxiety. And I wrote about that in my book, Thinking in Pictures, my autobiography. It came out over 25 years ago. It's got a new update afterward. I've been on antidepressant medication for 40 years mm -hmm. and I'm still on it. And what it did is it stopped the horrible panic attacks, absolutely horrible panic attacks that were pure biology. When I was in my late twenties, I had nonstop colitis that wouldn't stop. Oh. I went on the antidepressants then the colitis cleared up because my nervous system was no longer in a constant state of fright yeah. over right. nothing. And the mistake that's made with drugs like Prozac, for example, is too high a dose. Mm. The label doses for depression are too high. For anxiety, you might only need a starter dose or less than a starter dose. Yeah. And I can't I emphasize that enough. Too much, you get agitation, and then you cannot sleep. Yeah, and that, that, that's where I'm at with, with the anxiety medication. I'm, I'm at the starter dose, and I've been on it for yeah, five years. Which one eight, are you on? Uh, Ativan. Okay. Uh, Lorazepam is the, like the, I'm both of those names. But I've been on that starter dose since I was kind of started to deal with uh, my life. Uh, and, and so the, the uh, depression med med medicine, uh, as well as uh, the anxiety, I'm at that starter dose. And my therapist, he even, uh, my former therapist, he was even surprised at, at so many years past it, he's like, oh, you're only, t you know, you're only taking you know, 0.5 versus people are taking multiple times a day. Well, the mistake that's made with antidepressants is that, you know, you're going to get these little relapses. Yeah. And um, the anxiety goes in, in cycles. And I toughed out the relapses. It's sort of like uh, before I went on the medication, let's just use a car speeding analogy. Mm -hmm. My nervous system was cycling up here 200 miles an hour yeah. to 100 miles an hour. Then when I went on the medication, this is back when they had the double nickel, the 55 mile an hour speed limit. Mm -hmm. Then it's going 55 to 100. Cycling, uh, where before it was cycling up here. And I just stayed on the same dose. And I have seen disastrous messes when people were very stable on a medication and they went off of it complete disastrous messes. And then when they went back on, it sometimes does not work. Oh. You fry that circuit boards upstairs. Oh, right. Yeah. Especially with bipolar, that's true. Yeah. What, uh, so looking at your, your career, I'm just, I'm just wondering uh, from uh, some of our viewers and, and, and uh, listeners, what's, what do you think of, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, Dr. Temple Grandin, what, what do you feel the big, like one of the biggest accomplishments that you, you have that somebody could look at and say, I relate to that? Well, I, I um, you know, I've got accomplishments. I'm proud of things I've improved in the cattle industry, for example. I'm also uh, proud of um, when people uh, write to me and say, oh, my kid went to college because of one of your books or one of your interviews really helped. Uh -huh. I want to help the minds that, that think differently to be successful. Yeah. I also do a lot of talks on the different kinds of minds to business leaders like steel company, pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. banks, oh, all wow. kinds of companies, com uh, computer co uh, firms. Yeah. And I say, you need the skills. You need the skills of the different kinds of minds. Like I went yeah. and I visited that lab. I can tell you, without high-end skilled trades, that lab ain't going to operate. No, no. Somebody's got to maintain those three floors of equipment. Right. 
and it's not for the beginner stuff. Thank you for that. Heidi, no, I, 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 they, it, I knew it would have a support equipment, but it had twice as much support equipment than what I imagined. Yeah. Well, I have a few more questions, but um, I, the one that really keeps coming to mind for me is to ask you a little bit more. I think years ago I read something that you wrote about, it was, I think it was windows, but it might have been gateways. Well, I always had kind of door symbols. See, the thing is, when you think visually, I don't have abstract thinking. So when I was very young and I had a much smaller database, see, I'm a bottom-up thinker, just like chat GPT. And when I got older, I could think better than when I was younger because I got more data in the database. Oh. Right. And I learned from an English teacher while I was up visiting this lab, went to a beautiful little autism uh, community center, and we sat at the little kids' art table in grown-up chairs. And I sat across from an English teacher, and she said she caught six of her students uh, cheating with chat GPT in English class. Oh. And she said the papers that it wrote in November were worse than the papers it wrote four months later. In other words, chat GPTs learned how to write better fake student papers. Wow. You see, that's an example yeah. of learning as more and more data is put in the database. So if you don't have much data in the database, I have to have a visual image to think with. Yeah. So I looked at things like my futures, you know, going through doors, and that was shown really nicely in the HBO movie Temple Grandin. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Yeah. I, I forgot about that. But wasn't it written about? Was that also in one of Oliver Sacks' books? Yeah, he would have, you know, written about that. And okay. well, one thing that gave me a lot of insight is when I realized that, you know, other people think differently. Uh huh. But as being a total visual thinker for things like designing assessment systems for animal welfare, I just take a real practical approach that people can, you know, do out in the field. I've been using the um visual spatial identifier oh by... yeah the little test that's in that's in the visual visual yeah mm -hmm. yeah i've been using that with some of my supervisees um and that is interesting for the scoring on it but it's really interesting for the discussion of each question well yes because it's different approaches to thinking see a verbal thinker it tends to overgeneralize. Mm -hmm. a visual thinker gets down and gets a lot more detail now, the thing I've had to learn, and we have a pr principle in food safety called HAZA, Hazard Analysis Critical Control Points. And I love this because you can't have all the details. Yeah. You have to figure out which details are the critical control points, yeah. the ones that are really important. Sort of let's look at traffic rules. Probably the three most important things to enforce would be drunk driving, speeding, and running stop signs and red lights. And then four and five would be seat belts and texting. You see, those would be the true critical control points. You know, turn signals are important, but that's much lower priority than uh, drunk driving is. Yeah. yeah, I see that everything that you, your, your works uh, and speaking with, with you today seems to be kind of at a, at a macro level, you want to help people. So you want to help bad things from happening, things to get better, people to not be laid off from work. And, oh, yeah. and that's, that's, I think, awesome that in today's day and age that somebody like yourself has that in mind, that helping others, which uh, some may look at as like, oh, that, that's, that's too, too basic or too simple, that that's exactly how I feel. Well, the and so the, the, the simple stuff, a lot of times people aren't doing it. I'm seeing yeah. it's a 16 year old that's uh, labeled autistic and uh, everything's being done for him in this, kid has never gone in a store and bought something by themselves. You know, yeah. ordering food by themselves at a restaurant. Oh, yeah. Just basic things like that, they're not doing. Mm -hmm. They get so kind of, the parents get so locked into the label, <laughs> they can't imagine that their kid's even capable of doing anything. Right. Yeah. Heidi, did you have a, another question or two before we uh, end our time with Dr. Green? I wondered if there was anything around the doors that you had ever done that had anything to do with any art or de depiction of that. Well, not really. I have mainly I had photographs and photographs of real doors, and um, so I hadn't really done any art with that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, 
all the um all the drawings in here are by you right yes they yeah uh, that yes they are in okay. fact i wanted to put more pictures in this mm -hmm. but they call it says too expensive yeah those are yeah those are my drawings yeah wow. those are my drawings that are in there and we're going to be coming out with the children's edition oh okay uh, uh that's going to have a lot more illustrations in it yeah, I had somebody write a review on this saying, you know, book on visual thinking without pictures. I can tell you right now, the publisher didn't want to spend the money no. <laughs> on no. putting pictures no. in, in there because I would have put draw, more drawings yeah. in there and some photographs of jobs, um, um, you know, but they wouldn't let me. I do have one other. Pictures that, you know, they don't want to put those nice glossy pa pages in there. That, you know, I like it just the way it is with the matte page. And the drawings, it's just well, so I, 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 I We got those, they put, I got them to put in those, those, those drawings as sort of the beginnings of chapters. Mm -hmm. And they could print that on the same regular paper. And, yeah. And then I made sure they got them dark enough so you could see them. Exactly. <laughs> they did it, they were too light. I said, we got to have it so that you can see those. Yeah. But I guess part of the problem is, is that a lot of the book editors are verbal thinkers and the pictures are, the drawings are less important to them. Oh, they're beautiful. And then if you're a total talk. verbal thinker, the drawings are, are, are a lot less important. Yeah. yeah. I did want to ask one other thing that's, it feels a little off topic, but it's coming to mind. It's not really off topic. It's, I can't remember the exact name of the research study that had to do with the game Telephone. Do you remember that? No, I don't. Uh, I think that oh, we used to play that game as a kid, and it's a very by the time you'd gone to like ten kids, you just go. Okay, uh, so here's how I understand it: there's you've got three groups, and in each group, you have two groups. So, you would have um, people who have like neurodiversity with people who have neurodiversity playing it, and then over here you'd have typicals and and typicals playing it. I'm not sure all the proper terms, you know? And then in the other group, you'd have people who were neurotypical with people who are typical. And that group had the worst trouble communicating with one another. This is my understanding. Well, the other thing that once, we'll tell you about some studies that um, I did include in the book that I remember really well. Mm -hmm. It was a really cool study with uh, students from different types of high schools, an art oriented high school, a science-oriented high school and a literature and humanities-oriented uh, high school. And teams of students had the job of creating a new planet. Okay. All they were told, create a new planet, and there were teams of students. Okay. So art students come up with crystal planets, skyscraper planets, polar bears and palm trees. Mm. And then your science students made a round circle, described the atmosphere, kind of boring. And then the verbal students started writing stuff down. Then they realized that it was an art project, so they made splotches. Oh. But you know what really shocked me about this study? What's that? Verbal students did absolutely no planning. Oh. Where the visual students and the math students did planning. Because this is the problem with a lot of verbal concepts is overgeneralization. Yeah. You might talk about being more inclusive. Well, okay, how do you actually do that? Yeah. I'd rather look at specific examples that worked and maybe specific examples where something did not work, you know, due to the, maybe the flickering of the lighting. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to get a lot more specific and I've kind of figured out some of the critical control points at work. The flickering lighting, mm -hmm. the uh, rapid multitasking jobs, and then working memory problems with long strings of verbal instruction and then with tasks that involve sequence presented rapidly where I can't write it down. Their working memory issues, and and the accommodations are easy, but people will say, "Oh, they didn't give me accommodations." <clears throat> so then I go, "Now, what accommodations do you need?" Right. And I'm finding over and over again, rapid multitasking, crazy takeout window. Let's avoid it, and long strings of verbal instruction don't work. Pilots need a checklist. I need one too. Yeah. And there'd be a bunch of jobs that would not have been lost if a couple of minutes had been made to jot down the checklist. You've got some jobs, like keystrokes on a computer, that you use the same thing every day. So you learn that once. But then let's say you're on a construction project, every day they're gonna give me new stuff to install. Mm -hmm. I need to spend two minutes, just write them down in the order they want them done. I would need to do that. That's a very simple accommodation. And I like to find simple, practical ways 
to make these things better rather than just arguing, well, that's terrible, they didn't do accommodations. But again, that that oftentimes it's thought about in way too abstract a way. Yeah, I, I agree. As, a, as an instructor at a university, that's sometimes how the, the accommodations are. They're, they're very broad, they're very general, and they don't get, because I think they want to make it, I, I hope not, but I, I think they just want to make it easy for, for themselves and not really look well, at okay, things look, specifically. Well, a common accommodation at, at the university is extra time on tasks. Yeah. Okay, that's a very, very common one. But I think, uh, you see, the thing is, I think in specific example. Exactly. So, yeah. Rapid multitasking jobs that's come up over and over again. Now I found out about two electrician apprentice jobs lost, a fencing job lost wow. because they couldn't write down what they were supposed to do. You see, then I'm starting to see a pattern here. Hmm. You see, it's bottom up thinking. Yeah. And so the whole pilot's checklist idea. Okay, let's say I've got to uh, close out the Walmart cash register. Mm -hmm. Let me just write down the steps. That's a very simple accommodation. It is. Right? <clears throat> and then after I've done it for two weeks, I probably won't need the checklist anymore. So you've got two kinds of situations. A job, let's say, computer keystroke stuff, only have to learn that once. And then jobs where your list of tasks you do changes every day. So I'd need to jot down a new pilot's checklist every day. You see how I'm like, this is similar to the HACCP critical control points. Yeah. And these, and it, and this, these patterns I'm finding as I talk to people, I keep learning. It's like ChatGPT learns better and better to write fake student English papers. Exactly. And, and instead of having more time, which that's fair, but why, to your point, why do they need this? The, why do they need that more time? Let's well, get into the nuts and bolts of it. That's a common one. Yeah. Uh, the more time is extremely common. Yeah. That's just one of the things sometimes you have to accommodate. Yeah. But uh, uh, but things like the pilot's checklist thing, if that was just done up front, that would save a tremendous amount of jobs from being lost. Because people get mad and say, look, I already showed you how to work that fry machine at McDonald's. Are you stupid? I need to write down the steps, like for, especially for cleaning it yeah. or setting it up with new oil. Let me just write down the steps mm -hmm. yeah. and and if the boss thinks that's stupid remind them that the ffa federal aviation administration mm -hmm. requires pilots to use a checklist every single flight exactly yeah. and we're all human beings so we do we need checklists like the, yeah but that's um uh, i like to try to figure out practical stuff that people can take home and do mm -hmm. and then the lighting issue that yeah. uh uh, and, and it's not just autism, head injuries, people with head injuries okay. often have problems with the lights flickering. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah and you so can't find really light. See that. I take a very practical approach to this. Absolutely. You know, it's a shame to lose two electrician apprenticeships because you didn't write down the different things you were supposed to install in the order you were supposed to install them. And that would have taken two minutes to write it down. You know, when you mentioned the lights flickering, it reminded me of something else. So there are times when lights flicker and it's so subtle that you don't realize it for a while. Yeah. It's just very tiny. And if you're in that lighting and you have something like a head injury or symptoms of autism, it could be that it would take five hours before you'd end up with a migraine or feeling like you were going to well, get the thing sick. Is that people with migraines can get this. I want to get new construction. Let's just not use lights that flicker. And, and I learned from the lighting contractor at a book table a couple of years ago about this trick with uh, filming the room in slow motion on your phone and then playing it back in slow motion. So I recommend waving. Mm -hmm. but make sure when I play it back, it's yeah. slow motion. Well, one of my thoughts about it is um, when a person's having an issue, it seems like being patient for a long time might be needed to figure out what the issue is. And I would imagine well, with you your see, the light... thing I'm finding is there's certain issues that keep coming up over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. The lighting issue. When I have architects come to me, I say the single most important thing, make sure you get lights that don't flicker. Test them with the phone. Right. And, the, and then the multitasking, the crazy rapid multitasking. Mm -hmm. I want to avoid that. The right. A failure, and no, and overloading them with blah 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 blah, long strings of verbal instruction. I want to avoid that because mm -hmm. these are critical control points that have been coming up over and over again. Right. Of also, very common accommodations that we need to do. 
and they're easy to do. Another problem with verbal instruction is when an individual is given two steps and then told a related story and then given two more steps and told some other anecdote. And it's like, just stay on track. Yeah, stay. Give the bullet points. Maybe have to do it two or three times. Write it down, but not well, with I, like I, a whole the bunch. The thing of... I think is really important is write it down. Right. Because when these jobs were lost, they like a guy built a, a guy worked for a fencing company for years, mm -hmm. got a new boss, lost his job because he didn't write down what fences he was supposed to build and build them wrong, and lost a job. I talked to this person. Mm -hmm. And if he had, if he had just written it down, he wouldn't right. have lost the job. Right. And this is recent. Yeah. That's a year and a half ago. Yeah. This is not something from 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. This stuff's good. Electrician's Apprentice. That's a couple of months ago. Right. This is this is right now. Right. Yep. You know, so what I want to, you know, and I love that uh, critical control point approach because as I like kind of pick up case histories and I'm now categorizing the uh, places where I need the pilot's checklist, the places where I, jobs would ought to be just avoided, mm -hmm. chaotic stores during the holidays. Right. One McDonald's made a very nice accommodation. The uh, autistic lady was running the cash register mm -hmm. and when the store got busy, they had her clean tables. Ah, yes. It's a nice, simple thing they just did in that store. Yeah. So she could handle the cash register if it wasn't too busy. Right. Exactly. Well, Dr. Grandin, I, I think we're at the end of our time uh, together uh, for, for the podcast. I want to give a, a huge thank you for you taking the time, given such detail uh, stories uh, over the span of your, your life and they're very practical and I, I know that our viewers and listeners are gonna find them extremely useful and I wanna invite our viewers and listeners also uh, to check out templegrandin.com which they can find more information uh, about uh, Dr. Grandin, all the works that she, her, her current, her past works, uh, all her books are, are available and her, her most uh, most recent book, uh, Autism and Education, The Way I yeah, See It. That's aimed more at little at younger kids. Okay. That's my stuff, the other, I have another book called Different Not Less, which uh. is 18 people later in life getting diagnosed and writing about it. I think a lot of people would find that helpful. Okay. And my new visual thinking book where I talk about the different kinds of thinking and why we need them. Mm -hmm. uh, my autobiography, yep. I have a chapter in there on anxiety. And I'm one of these people where I don't know what would have happened to me if I hadn't discovered the medication yeah. a long time ago. And I'm still on it. That's why I'm drinking so much water. Yeah. Because that's one of the side effects. Mm -hmm. But I don't even know if I'd be alive because uh, they, if I hadn't taken it because the colitis was ripping my guts out. Oh. And two weeks after I went on the medication, it's almost completely cleared up. I still have a little tiny bit of it. Oh. But it just about almost Fan fixed it. Fantastic. And, it, and, and it, it was like uh, the old DuPont slogan, better living through chemistry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. We'll, uh, okay, it's been we'll, good to be here. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're going to take a couple pictures, so don't sign out quite yet. Oh, okay, I won't sign off yet. Yeah. Okay. We'll just close, close out right. for the, the TV port and audio portion. Thank you for joining us uh, on this episode of the Voices for Voices podcast. Uh, and a huge thank you to our guest, Dr. Temple Grandin. Uh, wealth of information, please check out templegrandin.com, seek out her works. Thank you for spending time with us today, and until next time, I hope you have a great day, and please be a voice for you or somebody in need. <laughs>